Hi everyone. Right, cool. Today we've got <laughs> Open with us. <laughs> and yeah, Open is the first DeFi options protocol. And it is super exciting to have them with us. Hi guys, how are you guys doing? I'm good. Thanks so much for having us, Lisa. Really, really uh, happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah, Lisa, thanks for having us. So let I think because Open is you know one of the first DeFi protocol uh, for options, and I don't think we need a lot of introduction. So if you can just do a quick summary of what Open is in three sentences for those who are new, that will be great. All right, uh, Open's a uh, DeFi options protocol and. Uh, you can use it to hedge your positions. If you have other DeFi positions, you could also use it uh, to buy options and express a view on if you think ETH is going to go up or down. Um, and it's been growing, you know, we've been growing massively recently and, and uh, we hit a hundred million dollars in volume last year. And it's only been growing since then uh, when we launched our V2 earlier this year. Yeah. So good that you talked about V2. So I want to chat a little bit more about the differences between V1 and V2. So what you have for V1 is really a little bit more of pricing automatically, where people just choose the strike prices, choose the different assets, and bam, done. And then all tokens or the old token representative of the asset will be created and then it'll be exchanged. For V2, it's more like an exchange where people put different prices in and then they're being matched with the, with the zero X protocol. Is that the difference between V1 and V2? Yeah, you could say that because uh, V1, like O tokens are traded on AMM. They're traded on Uniswap, mm -hmm. but now they're being traded on uh, zero X protocols. So it's definitely a very different experience, but the, the long run is actually to have both an AMM and an order book. And so right now we're working really hard on our own uh, AMM. Um, which we're really, really excited about. It's it's pretty, I would say futuristic, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's one of the most difficult problems I think in all of DeFi is like how to create good AMMs for like certain derivative classes. And so we're, we're working on that right now. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense because if you match the AMM model with the order book model, you can get a little bit more depth and liquidity, but how are they priced differently? Oh, they're being priced differently. So how do you justify the difference in pricing? Um, so I would imagine that uh, there's, you know, substantial arbitrage that would be possible. So let's take the order book, right? Um, the idea here is that like people can come and market make options. And so they can either take like the long side or the short side and post limit orders to build like liquidity, just like a centralized exchange you have depth on both sides. And in if an AMM is quoting a certain price in size, and like there's a different price in the order book, then there's an arbitrage, right? And so you'd imagine that difference to be arbed out uh, pretty quickly actually, because uh, DeFi is getting like increasingly efficient with time. So our, thinking is that the price difference would really be like if you interact in size, it's not like necessarily going to be like where the midpoint is. Um, yeah. And so for example, a person will be trading ODAI with the centralized, central, your, your, the, the version two of DAI being, and then people will be arbitraging between these two, right? ODAI and the order book version of Die spreads. Well, so it's that the order book version is also like O oh, die or like you know let's let's take ETH right. So let's mm. take a call option on ETH. Like let's call it O ETH. Mm. The protocol itself fundamentally mints this ERC twenty option, mm -hmm. and because that option is an ERC twenty, it can be traded on a two sided marketplace, um, which is an order book or on an AMM. Okay. So it's like this specific uh, like token that, mm. that, that represents an option and is like completely fungible uh, that people are trading in different, different venues. So even for decentralized order book, you're still creating OETH and yes. trading the OETH, not trading yes. the... Ah, got it. One thing that... So one thing that I always had, a question I always had is that OETH is really different for different strike prices, different expiry. 
but they're right. all considered all ETH and they're all fungible with each other. So no, so they're actually not fungible with each other. They're oh. so every option, as you said, has a strike and an expiry. And so within a strike and an expiry, it's completely fungible. So like, let's say I want to buy, you know, an option on ETH. I think ETH is going to go to 3000. So I have call options that are one month long uh, on ETH at 3000. And that means that like, let's say this is a really popular series and like a hundred different people own this specific option. Well, they're all completely fungible with each other. That allows you to have an AMM, which is like, pricing them in aggregate and like has a lot of liquidity for that specific series. Um, so the specific series, but, like one month expiry and 3000 call strike. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. Which is like what makes options so powerful because mm. for one underlying asset, there can mm. literally be thousands of options, different, completely different, like O tokens trading for just one asset, which is a huge new like marketplace that, that, that is, uh, really going to flourish in DeFi with the coming years because that's what we've seen in traditional markets is retail really uh, starting to to get really excited about options trading. I mean, we saw it with the GME mm-hmm. uh, saga, which is like still ongoing today. Like yeah. GME is up like 10, 12 percent or whatever. Um, but but we see that like the because they're so powerful and there's so many mm-hmm. different different distinct option assets that can exist on one underlying it's like unlocks a lot of new use cases how would so two questions how would you solve for liquidity issues because these are quite specialized so how many right. people will be demanding like a three thousand call option expiring one month so how do you deal with right, liquidity right. in that sense and uh, okay we get we go with that first yeah that's a great question it's the hardest question i actually wrote this in like the first version of the paper that we wrote, uh, the convexity paper, uh, I, I went through like kind of liquidity and how you might really um, uh, make sure there's a lot of it. So the first thing is you want to limit the number of strikes uh, that are that are trading mm-hmm. until you have a lot of liquidity on those strikes. But I think like ultimately that's kind of a short term solution. Um, the long term solution is to create an AMM where uh, you can specify any option that you want mm-hmm. and it will quote that. And then uh, it will atomically go to like the open protocol, mint that option and give it to you regardless of if it's even seen that option or not before. And so if there's any capital uh, in our AMM, it, it represents uh, liquidity for every single series is like the way that it would work. So something like a, something like a liquidity pool that only has ETH in there, in which you can mint different kind of options that represents ETH, and then that option can be traded in a secondary market, like outside Ex- of yeah, this. exactly, yeah. Ah, okay. Right. It is. Yeah. It is kind of what I think two of these protocols are doing. I think. Opium might be doing that and Hedrick is doing that? Well, so it's a little bit different than that. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with those, those two uh, mm. protocols, but the idea is that for, let's take uh, Hedrick, for example, mm. which is, you know, really interesting, like mechanism design uh, uh, that like they've come up with. The idea is that you have one-sided uh, liquidity which makes it a little bit different than an AMM. An AMM is like a market maker. It's making Mm. a market. So there's two-sided liquidity. So if I wanted to sell an option to Hedrick, I couldn't. I could only buy an option from the Hedrick pool. And there's what what that implies is that a price needs to be sent or or a price needs to be decided in a centralized way, Mm. right? In order to have true price discovery uh, for something on chain, you need to have a two-sided market because an AMM will react to people buying from it Mm -hmm. by increasing the price and people selling to it by decreasing the price, Mm -hmm. right? And that's how an AMM works. In Uniswap, you have an ETH USD market or ETH USDC market. If people come and buy ETH, it's gonna increase the price of ETH 
in the by the constant product formula. And if people sell ETH to the pool, it's going to decrease. And so you have like price discovery. Any new asset it's never seen can like actually get a market determined price. Um, did you lose me? Or no, no, I got it. Do you think that also solves for because one of the yeah. things is that we don't really price in volatility. So that is right. something that is just being assumed as as you know like a straight line. But there, like volatility exists, especially in these kind of assets with very fat tails. So do you, that right. could be one of the solutions to be pricing that in, or at least allow some price discovery for that. Exactly. So the idea is like for an option, an option is better to price in volatility and vols. Yeah. than it is to imply uh, to price it in dollars or any other currency because like that is like the native currency of an option um they're they're fundamentally like volatility in uh, 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 instruments and so if you take something like a a uh, something like hedgic that volatility is being priced in a centralized way uh, and then people can buy it from the pool and and that's actually a really interesting model I, I don't want to speak badly about that Ooh. model it's, it's very interesting think, yeah but yeah but it does not allow for like price discovery right Ooh. there's no like real market that can that can happen and so if you want to take like an option on a new asset that's never been seen before uh and just like spin up a new market and that's why you know like uniswap is so interesting because you can yeah. just spin up a new a new market on erc20 that like no one has ever seen before and have price discovery um, that's not possible with a hedging model. You need a two-sided marketplace. And that's what we're, we're building. And then the long-term vision for that is like, open will be the first place ever where people can create an option on any asset, any arbitrary ERC-20. And then that's actually like trading and has liquidity. And so this is going to allow for like a huge amount of use cases we've never even imagined because it'll be like, before any centralized exchange, before anyone else can list a new option on a new underlying asset, like mm -hmm. it'll be trading in a liquid way and open. And so that's like one thing that we're working uh, on for the next few months. Mm. So going back to the second question, when you talk about AMMs, I think there are two parts to it. The first part is upon expiry for these different options, what happens to the other side of the AMM? So if let's say it's you were, ETH call 3000 and one month, and then you're pairing it with USDC. So what happens to the USDC after? And for the other, like going back to liquidity again, where, yeah, what happens to liquidity of the asset, of the AMM? Right, yeah, this is a, this is a great question. So, um, so basically, let's take the first way that the protocol works. So I bought a call option um, on ETH for 3000 USDC, right? And so that means that at expiry, I can trade my uh, 3000 USDC for ETH, right? Mm -hmm. That's called physical settlement where I am bringing my actual 3000 USDC and I'm like buying ETH with it, right? Then cash settlement is when I don't actually have to come and bring my 3000 USDC, instead, the I would you know be giving three thousand dollars. I'd be getting ETH in return, and if ETH is worth like three thousand five hundred dollars, I'm giving three thousand and I'm getting three thousand five hundred. It's the same thing as like me just getting five hundred dollars, right? And so in cash settlement, the way that it works in Open V two is that there actually isn't like two assets. There's just one asset, and then it gets divided between the option seller and option buyer mm. at expiry so that mm. both of them get their right payouts. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, instead of physical settle in version one, it's cash settle in version two. So you have a little right. bit more liquidity to play around with. And I guess upon expiry, liquidity closes, that, that specific Uniswap pool closes and liquidity is added to a new pool. Right, so basically uh, a few things happen. So the first thing that happens is um, it's auto exercise. So like in V1 and with a lot of other protocols, like as an option buyer, I buy my option and then if it's in the money, I have to come and actually exercise it later, which is like 
can be a pain. Gas prices can be really high. I have to remember if I forget, I might lose a lot of money because like uh, there's these big liveness requirements, mm -hmm. right? We found that users like, you know, ha have, we're trying to basically fire and forget. They're trying to like buy the option and then just like, if it goes up, they're like super happy. And if it doesn't, you know, they want to come at any other time and like deal, uh, kind of close out their position. And so it's auto exercise. So at Xbury, I don't have to come and bring my USDC and get ETH. I'll just get ETH if it's in the money. And so I, I can just chill. That's one of the reasons we introduced cash settlement. Um, and when it comes to rolling over, like what happens to an option position once I already like uh, I'm, I'm closing out that option position or once I've actually uh, it's expired. Well, the idea is that in V2, there's this idea of an operator and it's actually like influenced by DYDX. It's this really interesting engineering primitive. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to give some contract control of your funds in open. So you can have an operator that will automatically roll over your option to the next series. Let's say I have $3,000 calls for one month, mm -hmm. it expires, I get a bunch of collateral, then I can open the next month position. But I don't want, you know, for gas reasons and other reasons, I don't want to actually have to come and do that, right? It's a bad experience to come every single month. So I just give operator uh, privilege to my, to my funds and then that operator will auto roll over. And since that operator has like, um, is like open source solidity code, mm -hmm. I can, it's a trustless process as well. So that's kind of how the rollover process would work. So it's kind of like pop futures, but it's pop options. Yeah, to a certain extent. What is, so what is doing... pop futures? I actually don't oh, know. So like I've not heard of that futures. before. Just perpetual Sorry? futures? Perpetual oh, futures. Oh, perp futures. Yeah, 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 100%, yeah. So it's you can like do perpet... cash settle between that period and then whatever that's remaining, you just roll over to the next period. Exactly. So. One thing, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but like the VIX, right? The volatility mm -hmm. index. Um, and so that's like an extremely popular instrument um, that, and like actually like how it's built is something that's very abstracted away. Most yeah. people just think of it as like it's volatility, but fundamentally it's a perpetual option position where mm -hmm. what, what happens is the way that like a VIX ETF is created is that you buy one month options mm -hmm. And then when those options expire, you buy another set of one month options. And so uh, again, options are like the best volatility training instrument. And so since you're buying like these, this basket of options and you're continuously rolling it over, so it's always like a month away. Um, and that's an example of a perpetual option position that becomes possible. Like there's no VIX for crypto yet, right? Right, yes. Uh, and it's it just should be because are you guys yeah, creating so people that? are actually working on that on top of open right now, which is okay. really exciting. It's yeah. like one of the coolest things. That's definitely something that we need. We do because crypto is like the most volatile asset class. Right? Like yeah. Bitcoin is a trillion dollars and still crazy in terms of volatility. There's mm -hmm. no other trillion dollar liquid asset that has that level of volatility. So having like these volatility indices are not just great for hedging for protecting your positions. Mm -hmm. They're amazing in as like a, a way to, again, as I say, price discovery yep. for the market to estimate what volatility will be in the future, even just mm -hmm. like as a gauge, as like an indicator, that's like super powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, super excited about the idea of like perpetual non, non, uh, uh, non expiring like mm -hmm. options positions. It's gonna yeah. be so cool. That yeah. is so cool. That, that really is so cool. Super excited about that. Yeah. So, well, we talked a lot about very complicated stuff, but a lot of people in DeFi are not at that stage yet of very complicated stuff. So how can, how can some a basic user, like a mom or dad that is interested in DeFi, get access to OPYN or Open and benefit from Open? Right. So I will say a few things because I think... Um, it's really important as DeFi creators that we really care a lot about user and the risks that they have. So what I will say is like, none of this is like financial advice. 
And like, if you're ever trying out anything in DeFi, it's experimental, it's risky. You can lose your money. Open, experimental, risky, you can lose your money. So I'm not telling you to gamble with money you don't have. You should be you know, very mindful. But if you're interested in like learning options and like crypto options specifically, like open is like a really good way to start uh, because it's like completely permissionless and like it's super, super interesting uh, because you can like see all the code. It's completely transparent. So what are some like simple positions? Uh, I, I think like one example is just like buying a put option, a short term put option, maybe to protect your downside. So what it, way it works is that a protective put option allows you to sell any asset you have for a predetermined price. And so a predetermined price is like, let's say ETH right now, it's trading at like, I don't know, 1700 or something. Uh, let's say I buy a put option at 1700. That means no matter how much ETH crashes in the open market, this put option gives me the right to still sell it at 1700. So let's say ETH goes to $500 big crash. I own a lot of ETH, for example, I would lose a lot of money. But if I had options contracts, that meant that no matter how low it goes, I still have the ability to sell at 1700. And so it protects my downside, but I still have my upside because if ETH goes up, I don't have to exercise. I don't have to sell my ETH for 1700. I have the option to, but I don't have to. So I have the upside and like limited downside. So that's like a very common um, uh, strategy that, that a lot of people use. Wade is also, uh, would love to hear your thoughts as well. You've been thinking a lot about uh, these kinds of things to do. Yeah, I would say, I mean, going back to that example of a protective put, the easiest way to communicate that is you're buying insurance on whatever asset you're buying that put option on. Um, and the cost of that insurance is what you pay in the premium for that. So if you have, if you're worried about the price of something going down dramatically, you can effectively buy an insurance policy on it for a specific period of time to be able to pay whatever strike price you want on that asset. Um, and another simple option strategy um, that we've seen a lot of users on open use is going long a call, which means you're buying a call option. Now, different than buying a put option, which gives you the right, but not the obligation to sell an asset at a certain price, a call option gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy a certain asset at a certain price. So if ETH is currently trading at 1700 and you want to make a bet that ETH, or in your mind, you think ETH is gonna go up to 5,000, you can buy a call option on ETH at 1700 to make sure that no matter how high ETH goes up in price, you still have the right to buy it at 1700. And we've seen a lot of users come to open because they, you know, they might have $1,700, but they don't want to put that in one um, ETH. They'd rather buy as many calls as possible, which gives them leverage so that in the event that ETH does go up to 5,000, if they bought 10 call options, that gives them the right, right to buy 10 ETH at 1,700, no matter what the price is trading at. Yeah. And I think something that you guys also have in V2 is to combine strategies together so users can execute them in one, one transaction, like buying protective put as well as selling a call at a higher strike. And that's actually very useful as well because it's, it's cheaper than by than executing two transactions. And it's also a lot easier for users to realize, oh, all I have to do is just put some numbers in and I'm protected for a specific range. So I think that's good. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so that's like, um, it's basically uses a similar mechanism to flash loans. Yes. So like a flash loan, essentially, you're borrowing a lot of money with no collateral. Like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Well. The way it works is that the if you're if you're doing a flash loan on, on DYDX, for example, you're borrowing money and but it never checks that your position is properly capitalized until the end of your transaction. 
So you can borrow, then do like five or six different things. And then at the end, you repay to DYDX. But so for open, it's similar where you can mint options. You can like flash, flash mint options with no collateral and then take advantage of an arbitrage somewhere and then do like four or five different things um, as a user, you never have to make sure it's properly capitalized until the end. So it's potentially possible that you make money off of like the option position and you use that money to collateralize the options that you already minted earlier, which makes it like significantly better for a user and like more capital efficient to do, mm -hmm. to do things like that. Awesome, fantastic. So is there any, if you could give one advice to derivatives traders or you know, people using open, what kind of, what advice would you give? Oh, this is a great, great, great question. Um, what advice would I give? Oh, this is interesting. I think like, well, maybe more important is uh, would love advice from them. So, so we can make like the absolute best pro uh, protocol possible. Um, I think like fundamentally, there's a few things that like need to be solved. I think like, for example, the first thing is, is like the gas issue. And this is something like all of DeFi is dealing with mm -hmm. as a collective, right? And I'm really optimistic on like the layer two solutions that are out there, but I still think it's gonna be a while until like there's this kind of, uh, there's this kind of like group of DeFi projects that are all listed on layer two and trading mm -hmm. with liquidity. Um, that to me seems like something that I, I'm, you know, that needs to be solved first. But yeah, in terms of the advice that I'd give traders, I would just say like, make sure that you're, you're always betting with money that you're okay losing, like never like overextend yourself. And also, uh, yeah, I think like there's a lot of really cool things out there to try and a lot of incredibly novel trading strategies are going to come out of DeFi. And so just like really excited to see people experimenting and, and, and trying new things. Wonderful. And, and wait. For me, I think the one piece of advice I would give traders, because we see so many of them come to the open discord, ask us questions on Twitter, is that as intimidating as options sound, if you don't know anything about them, they're actually very simple when you break them down into basic option strategies. So, and they can also help people who are coming into DeFi protect their assets. So we use a lot of words that um, might be intimidating, but if you're new to DeFi and new to options, don't be afraid to ask questions or spend a little bit of time reading up on options basics, because I promise they're not that, um, difficult of instruments to get started with. You can do some very complex things with them, um, but it's not something that you need to have a ton of, money, ton of money for to trade. In fact, like options are inherently cheaper than buying the asset outright. Um, so just don't be intimidated by them. Thank you. And is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa, for having us. This has been really fun. and. Um... If you want to learn more, uh, you can go to open.co, opyn.co. Uh, you can also join our Discord. Uh, it's uh, uh, tiny.cc slash open discord. Um, and ask me or Wade any question, uh, uh, and we'd be happy to, to chat about it uh, and, and especially answer your questions because we love teaching new people about options and DeFi and uh, all the possibilities that are that are going to come. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for your yep. time. And yeah, do you have anything to add, Wade? No, I was going to say thank you so much for having us on. Um, and then I think it, if at any point it'd be helpful to to your audience to host an AMA or to ask specific yeah. questions, like we're always here. Um, and the entire open team is genuinely so passionate about options, so passionate about crypto and DeFi. Um, so please, like, no question is too dumb. Um, feel free to reach out. I'm thinking of hosting something like a options AMM, AMA, no, 
AMA, not AMF. The thing of hosting and options stuff on Clubhouse, so people can be asking because there are a lot of people asking more and more complex questions, and it'd be good to yeah. have different kind of you know like you guys experts coming in to be discussing that. Would that be interesting for you? That would be super fun. I would love to. Yeah, actually, I absolutely love uh, talking about this. My favorite topic in the world. Uh, so just let me know, and I'll be there. Okay, good. Then I'll organize that and get people to come and ask questions. All right. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you guys so much for your time once again. And we'll speak soon. All right. Thanks Thank so much, Lisa. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.